I guess I should say, uh, I, I guess I should say that uh, even though primarily in the past uh, I focused on fiction, uh, I've also written uh, uh, creative nonfiction, which uh, my book that's coming out, uh, uh, it will be out March 1st uh, from the University of Nebraska Press, The Great Endorsement. Uh, so that's creative nonfiction. And then I've also written plays uh, and I've written uh, a couple of screenplays, although uh, none of them have been uh, filmed. So uh, those are the things that I write. Uh, and then I was I was asked to uh, talk about some like beginning uh, writers, like the mistakes that they may that they make. Uh, and so the first thing that uh, I will talk about, and then so I have my few things that I'm going to talk about, and then you guys can just ask me questions. Um, but the the first thing that uh, I'm going to talk about in uh, beginning writers' mistakes, uh, although many of you might already uh, uh, be beyond this, uh, but uh, the first thing that I would say is revision is the most important part uh, of writing. Uh, and I know that I sound like a composition uh, teacher, which I, I also teach composition, uh, but revision really is that important. And I sometimes think that uh, people start to think it isn't either uh, because of the fact that they hear stories about famous authors who supposedly wrote some book or poem or story or play in a comically short amount of time. And so people think, see, you don't have to revise like this person wrote, you know, this thing in 25 minutes and it's one of the greatest things ever written. Uh, but I promise you that those stories are frequently overblown uh, and are a kind of like PR for the writer uh, to make them seem even greater uh, than they might be. Uh, and so to me, that's one place that this comes from. And another place that it comes from is, so what I used to say, although I've, I've changed it a little bit, and I used to say, don't fall in love so quickly uh, with your writing. And I've uh, changed that a little bit to, uh, yes, it's perfectly fine to fall in love with your writing, but make sure that you set the bar fairly high. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because there are times when we're writing that we finish a draft and it's been so difficult to work on. And we've had all of these ideas swirling around in our heads we just, you know, look at it and think this must be perfect. Uh, and so when, when we do that, uh, we are unable to see any of the problems that might arise. And so one of the things that I tell people is, uh, one thing that you should do is when you finish a draft, just set whatever it is that you've written aside and then come back later and read it. Like it might be even, you know, you might have to give yourself a day, you might have to give yourself a week, maybe even a month uh, or longer. And the reason why is because once you give yourself this time, uh, you are no longer so extremely attached to it. You haven't uh, recently gone through the ordeal of writing it. Uh, and so, in, and the other thing is, to be honest, you also will have forgotten some of the things that are in it. Uh, and so then when you go back, you can see it for what it is. And the other thing uh, that I tell people is, is if, so for instance, you have a writer's group, I uh, assume anyway, uh, that you read each other's writing, uh, people might read your work right after you've finished it, and they give you comments, and you might immediately think, that's wrong, this person has no idea what they're talking about. And that's perfectly fine for you to think, but again, if you write all of those comments down or you get them written down for you, however you guys happen to do it, uh, and you look at them later on, you might find that you don't think quite the way that you did earlier. Uh, and so what I'm saying with revision, and this is a big thing either because of the stories from great writers in the past, uh, or even just because you've gone through the ordeal of writing something, which can be harrowing in itself, 
uh, there are just times where we feel like, obviously, this is perfect, uh, when it might just not be. Uh, and so you have other people who can who comment on your work, and then you have to become your own uh, 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 critic too. And once you're able to do that, once you're able to listen to others because you've moved away from the time period of the writing, once you can be honest with yourself and go back through. So the thing that I do is once I have like enough time has passed, I will read something that I've written and I just start writing make better in the margins. Uh, sometimes I know how to make it better. And so I start doing that. But other times I, I just know it needs to be better, but I don't know how to do it yet. So I just write make better. Uh, and at that point, certainly when I wrote it the first time, I thought that was good, but I don't anymore. Uh, and so uh, uh, if you are willing to listen to others, even if you have to give yourself some time, if you are willing to criticize your own work, uh, then you can revise and you can make your pieces better and better, no matter what it is you're writing. Uh, I don't care what genre it is. Uh, and the, the thing that I would say uh, is once you start getting good at revision, because you're willing to criticize your own work, you're willing to listen to other people when they say they don't think something is, you know, operating very well, uh, you shouldn't set the bar so high on yourself that you can never, ever get your work out there. Uh, so for instance, when I was writing my novel, I kept talking to a friend of mine about it. And at one point he asked me if maybe the only thing I was going to write for the rest of my life was the first chapter of that novel. <laughs> and so at that point, I finally realized I just had to work on the other stuff and go back later uh, and figure out how that first chapter was going to work. Uh, and so that's the other thing is, is that yes, you have to listen to other people. You have to be willing to criticize your own work, but you shouldn't raise the bar so high on yourself that it will never ever be done. Uh, and so that's kind of the balancing act in revision. However, the first thing is being willing to actually revise your work. Uh, and I would say that that's very difficult. I went through that too. Uh, there were plenty of times when I was uh, you know, a freshman uh, at Kent State, and that's where I went to undergrad, where I would write one draft and I'm like, well, this is perfect. We might as well just send this off to the publishers who are obviously gonna take it right now. Uh, and then later on when I learned to revise, I didn't think that way anymore. I knew that I had to make things better. Uh, and so we can, we can all fall into that trap. Uh, and then the, like the other thing is, is that like in workshop, for instance, uh, people will frequently just start uh, defending their work uh, and frequently, you know, even though there are times when people respond to your work and it's not the most helpful thing in the world, uh, if no one in the world can criticize your work because you think it's perfect, then you need to work on the revision stage. Uh, so that's my talk about revision. So that's, that's a big thing. Uh, so now I'll talk about a slightly smaller uh, thing. Uh, and that's, uh, and this is more people who are working uh, in dialogue. Uh, and so what I'm going to say is uh, when you are writing dialogue, uh, believe it or not, the words said or says, those are probably the best dialogue tags. You can use other words, but they really start to call attention to themselves. Now, here's the thing. Uh, my, my sort of work most of the time is more experimental. So I have no problem uh, calling attention to lots of things that people who aren't working in the experimental mode, they don't wanna call attention to. Uh, so I, I write, uh, uh, sometimes my work is metafictional. So I will tell you what the plot of the story is as it's unfolding, uh, like a critic might sometimes. Uh, however, if you are not working in that mode and you are working in a more realist mode, uh, then said and says frequently are the best dialogue tags because they don't call attention to themselves. And even then, once you have established who's speaking, so for instance, maybe the, the first line is Chris and the second line is Shannon, 
once you've established that, you don't even need dialogue tags anymore because we know by the lines who's talking. Uh, and so you don't have to crowd uh, your work with lots and lots of dialogue tags. Uh, and so sometimes people want to, you know, say, uh, you know, like Dave yelled or something like that. Well, uh, we probably get the idea from the way you wrote the dialogue. So we don't need that. Uh, and then there are lots of other words. Yes, you can use other words sometimes, but for the most part, said and says are just gonna work. Uh, and then you don't even need those dialogue tags if the dialogue continues on and we know who's talking on each line. Uh, so that that is a smaller thing uh, that I frequently talk about. And I guess the other one is when you are formatting dialogue, uh, at least uh, in the United States, uh, one person talks per paragraph. And so that means even if uh, a line of dialogue is yes, and then the next one is I know, those are still going to be on their own lines. Uh, and uh, it makes it much easier for the reader. I know like, for instance, if you read Franz Kafka, he puts all of his dialogue into one great big chunk. Why? I don't know. But that's the way he did it. However, most of the books that you're going to read from even the past hundred years published in the United States and even in England, uh, you're frequently going to see one person per paragraph. And even if, if, even if the dialogue, the line of dialogue is one word. Uh, so like, that's why if you look at, for instance, a Hemingway story, sometimes you just have these pages of dialogue uh, and the dialogue, the people don't talk for very long. Uh, so that's, that's another thing that I, I will point out. Uh, now, here's, here's a bigger thing. Uh, uh, fiction frequently, uh, again, unless you're working in a more experimental mode, fiction frequently is made up of scenes. And to be honest, even a lot of uh, experimental work is going to be made up of scenes. Sometimes, and this is, you know, maybe in more genre writing, sure, uh, but even in other kinds of writing, people think you need like a giant prologue in order to explain the entire world or the entire history uh, of a particular work uh, when, to be honest, frequently you don't. I'm not saying you can never write uh, prologues. My, my biggest rule of writing is uh, all universal rules of writing are wrong, including this one. Uh, and, and the reason that I say that is because you will find people who break certain rules and man, does it work wonderfully. Uh, but other times they follow rules and because they follow them, their piece works really well. Uh, and so it does depend, but what I'm saying is, is that scenes are going to pull people through your work and you can give information while those scenes are unfolding. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I use a lot of examples from movies uh, uh, because I am heavily influenced by movies in my writing. Uh, but the beginning uh, of the movie Reservoir Dogs, everything that is being said by the characters in the opening of that movie seems inane. And yet, everything that they say tells you things about each one of those characters, even though it seems completely inane, like we could have done without that scene. Uh, but if you go back after you've watched the entire movie, you see that you learned quite a lot about each one of those characters through that seemingly inane dialogue in the scene at the beginning. Uh, so he does, so Tarantino doesn't give you a big explanation as to the world that he's dealing with. Instead, he gives you this scene that seems unnecessary, but it's extremely necessary. Uh, and I would say that you can do that with your own work. I'm not saying that everybody should write like Tarantino. Uh, what I am saying is you can give us, for instance, an opening scene where you drop bits of information in uh, but you can also have your characters uh, as they are talking and moving through the world, they can do things that signal to the reader uh, what they are like and what the world is like. Uh, and so that way you don't have to give us the Wikipedia article on the entire world you happen to be dealing with. 
uh, or the entire background of, uh, if you're writing historical fiction, the entire background on that particular historical era. Uh, instead, the scene can tell us, and the other thing is, is that that scene will pull the reader through because scenes themselves operate like entire plot arcs. So for instance, you might have an opening scene where a character uh, just wants to get a drink of water. And while that character is doing that, you're watching the character, what they do, what they say, how they interact with other characters, how they interact with the world. And suddenly a lot of information is being conveyed. And also as the reader is reading, they know this person really needs some water uh, and that's what they're going for. And so they're being pulled through and getting the information uh, instead of feeling like they're just doing research. Not that research is bad, uh, but if you're writing fiction, for instance, this works. Uh, and to be honest, if you're writing creative nonfiction, it can work too. Uh, so I, I would say that scenes are something that people frequently forget about because they get so caught up in the information, they get so caught up in the voice that they want to use, uh, they get so caught up in everything else, they lose sight of the scenes. Uh, and yet I would say that uh, creative nonfiction frequently and fiction uh, and definitely plays and screenplays are made of scenes. Uh, and again, my novel is more on the experimental end and yet they're constantly, I was thinking about what's the scene, what's going on in this scene, even though my writing is not, you know, aiming for uh, verisimilitude. Uh, all right. So uh, that's, that's my talk on scenes. Now uh, I'll talk about a smaller thing and this is about dialogue again. Uh, use contractions in your dialogue. Uh, so uh, I, I constantly feel like I'm fighting against uh, composition teachers who say don't use contractions, uh, but people speak with contractions. Uh, and they even use contractions that aren't necessarily in the dictionary, like uh, dunno, you know, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's not don't, I don't know, it's I don't know. Uh, and people say that sort of thing all the time. Or I wanna go get a drink. Uh, that's wanna, W-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. People say that all the time. Uh, I, I used to uh, work uh, uh, for, a, uh, a county and I worked in the mosquito control unit and I found that so many people said mosquito. This was people of all different uh, social classes, tons of them said mosquito. They did not say mosquito. Uh, and so I think that people speak, uh, the way people speak can like connect uh, your readers to your dialogue. One that my sister and I, uh, I notice, uh, uh, use is slike, S-L-I-K-E. And that's a contraction for it's like. Uh, and now, am I saying that you have to jam all of these weird contractions into your dialogue all the time? No. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is that people don't speak as if they were practicing writing their composition papers, uh, which are formal. People don't talk like that. Uh, and frequently even, you know, like people you might think uh, talk like that don't. Uh, and so uh, I would say that use contractions in your dialogue. And the other thing is, is that people frequently interrupt to other people when they're talking. Uh, and so in your dialogue, you can have people interrupt each other. You don't have to have someone speak in a perfect speech uh, and then the next person talks. Uh, it doesn't really work like that. Now, here's the thing. Though. Dialogue is not conversation. It's the essence of conversation. And so I'm not saying that you have to absolutely mimic the way people speak in conversations, because frequently people forget what they were talking about. People frequently like go off on tangents and it's not that they forget what they were talking about originally, it's that they just don't care anymore and now they're talking about something new. I'm not saying that you have to absolutely mirror that. What I am saying though is uh, that dialogue works better when it sounds a little more natural. And again, 
This rule falls apart if you're purposefully uh, making your character sound unnatural. Uh, however, uh, I would say use contractions uh, in your dialogue. Uh, now, here's, uh, here's a big one that I've started to notice uh, more recently. Uh, and that is, if you are writing fiction or creative nonfiction, remember that you have a narrator. So if, and particularly if you are writing third person, if you are writing in the third person, you have a narrator. And so that means you never ever have to use expository dialogue. And that's something that I think has started to bleed into fiction and creative nonfiction writing because we hear it so much in movies and TV shows and stuff like that. So for instance, if you have two characters who are talking uh, and you know they're a couple and one says, well, honey, you know we got married 27 years ago in Connecticut on a very cloudy, rainy day. Yeah, yeah, she does know that. Uh, and there's no way that you need to say that unless the person has sustained some sort of head injury. Uh, and that sort of thing has to be done in plays and screenplays sometimes uh, be because of the fact that there's no narrator. But in prose, there is. And so the narrator can give you that information and it doesn't seem awkward at all. And so you can save your dialogue for things that uh, are actually going to be interesting and that people might actually say to each other. You don't have to use expository uh, uh, dialogue. People in plays and screenplays get trapped into that. And frequently um, in, let's say, science fiction, I see this a lot because they have to explain stuff to you and there's no narrator to do it. Uh, but in prose, you have a narrator and everybody's cool with that. Uh, so you can do that. The other thing I, I would say is that a narrator can really establish the tone uh, of a piece in a way that people forget about. So even if your narrator isn't a character, your narrator can still have a personality. So if you want, you know, your piece to maybe have like a sarcastic vibe, you can have a sarcastic narrator. Uh, and uh, I, so I would say that one of the rare times that we saw this in uh, uh, the more visual image uh, in television was the show Arrested Development. That show has a narrator and that narrator absolutely establishes the tone of that show. Uh, and I would say that there are plenty of books, like even if you go back to Dostoevsky, uh, the, the Brothers Karamazov is written in a plural first person that is told from the point of view of the town and that absolutely establishes the tone of that book, even though they're not, that narrator really isn't a character. Uh, and so what I'm saying is, remember that you have a narrator when you are writing prose. Uh, so that's, that's another one. Uh, now, uh, uh, there are two more that are smaller things, uh, and then I will, uh, whatever questions you have for me, I'm happy to answer. Uh, and so one of them is, uh, and this is a smaller thing, but sometimes people like to write uh, pieces that are a little weird, uh, but they get nervous about that. Uh, and so they do something in order to dismiss the weirdness. And so the classic example of this is ending the story with, it was all a dream. Uh, I argue that dreamlike is better than it was all a dream. And the reason why is because dreamlike is strange. It can be jarring, arresting, mm -hmm. uh, disconcerting, all of those things, uh, but it doesn't give you an out. So consequently, your readers have to figure out what to do with it. But if you say it was all a dream, they can immediately go, oh, then I don't have to care. Uh, and I would say that one of the best uh, 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 plays on this is the stand-up comedian Stephen Wright uh, said that one time when he was a kid, uh, he went to his grandpa and he said, uh, Grandpa, I, I had the weirdest dream. And then he, ex he describes the dream. And then he says, Grandpa, what do you think that means? And his grandpa says, well, it means you were sleeping. 
which means that we don't have to do anything else with it. Uh, but if it's dreamlike, if you don't give your reader an out, then they have to figure out what to do with it. Uh, and I would say that that is always going to be much more powerful. And this connects to the last thing that I'm gonna say, uh, and that is don't be afraid to let your readers do some work. Uh, like they, uh, your readers, you can trust them to understand things uh, without always giving them lengthy explanations. Uh, you can understand, you can, you know, uh, uh, you can, you know, trust that they will go and look things up if they need to. Uh, you don't have to explain absolutely everything. Yes, I'm not saying that you should therefore make uh, everything you write uh, uh, so like bizarre and distant that no one could ever understand it at all. Uh, however, uh, I'm saying that your uh, readers uh, can do work and frequently they will prefer to do that work. And my constant example for this is there's this movie called The Machinist. And The Machinist is this very dreamlike movie where you constantly are questioning why the things that are happening are happening. And then you get to the end and the movie so explains itself, you go, well, I have no more questions. And that means you're done with it. Whereas if it didn't explain itself that much, you could continue thinking about it later. And I would say that that's much more powerful. Uh, all right, so uh, I've talked a lot. Uh, let's, uh, I'm uh, not positive that these were all of the things that you were looking for. So you can ask me questions and. Uh, I'll see if I can answer them. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. I have, a, uh, I'll start this off. I've, you introduced a term I have never heard before. Uh, Metafictional? What is that? Well, Metafiction uh, is fiction that uh, uh, will announce uh, to you that it is fiction. So for, for instance, uh, there's a story uh, uh, by John Barth called Lost in the Funhouse. Uh, and midway through the story, uh, the narrator uh, says, in a story called Lost in the Funhouse, you would assume that we would begin in the uh, Funhouse and the main character would get lost, but we're not even in the same town as the Funhouse yet. At this point, we may never get there. And so it is actively like showing you what the story is doing and thinking about it uh, whereas frequently stories like try to convince you that you're just looking in on another world uh, and they are not self-conscious about being fiction. Okay. <laughs> and you say you, you have a book coming out that is uh, metafiction? No, uh, so, I, so the book, uh, my book that's coming out is uh, creative nonfiction. Uh, that's the great endorsement. Uh, but uh, some of my stories in my novel uh, are metafictional, where they uh, constantly comment on their own uh, operations. Okay. Uh, I'm going to squeeze in another one. What uh, do you have required reading for your students? And if not, what kinds of books do you refer them to on uh, developing their their writing craft do you uh, do you recommend save the cat or uh what are some of the good resources that you point them to uh so the the books that i use for uh that are specifically about writing uh i use david lodge's the art of fiction uh and then uh the reason that i use that is because it is the first uh, at least that I I run uh, that I ran into. It's the first book on writing uh, that does not have a particular aesthetic that it is arguing for. It just says here are a bunch of different kinds of things you could do. Now it's up to you to decide which of those you're interested in. Uh, so uh, that is that's why the David Lodge, The Art of Fiction, uh, and then uh, for creative nonfiction, uh, I use uh, Tell It Slant, and it's for the, uh, a similar reason. Tell It Slant seems more like a textbook, uh, whereas David Lodge's uh, book was originally a series of small articles 
uh, that appeared in uh, magazines and newspapers, and then they were all collected together. Whereas uh, Tell It Slant, which is about creative nonfiction, was specifically made as a textbook. Uh, and then uh, uh, I think it's called uh, The 3 a.m. Epiphany, uh, and that is the book of writing exercises that I use sometimes. Uh, and so uh, that uh, is another uh, book that I, I recommend. Uh, but in my workshop, uh, whereas, so my fiction workshop, I, I have the students buy uh, the art of fiction, uh, but otherwise it's all about the work uh, being done in the class. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, who else has questions for Andy? Uh, Ruth? Ruth? Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, what is the best piece of writing you have ever read and why? Uh, no, man. Uh, so, I mean, this is one of those that would change daily. Uh, I, will, I will go with uh, a piece that was uh, extremely influential uh, on me was a short story called The Entropy by Thomas Pynchon. Uh, and that was one where uh, the, the first time I read it, uh, it just seems like it is this like long uh, description of a party that's been going on for days. Uh, and yet it's called the entropy, uh, which is a scientific concept. And so the first time I read it, I was like, I'm not entirely sure how this, how this is connecting here. But then I started reading about entropy uh, and applying it to what was going on in the story. And I suddenly saw that this story that seems like it's about a bunch of people like getting drunk at a party, like was doing a whole lot more than I ever expected it was doing. Uh, and so I, I would, that sort of surprise uh, became something that like I attached to where it was yeah, you could read the story just for what's going on uh, on the surface level, but there's a whole lot more that's going on also. And, and that was really kind of a revelation to me. Uh, uh, but yeah, so the, uh, uh, I, I would go with that story. Uh, uh, and it's also one of those stories that each time I read it, I feel like I understand more about it uh, and how it's constructed. Uh, and that also amazes me. Do you encourage critical reading? Uh, so what do you mean? Well, I, I could be more specific. Uh, for instance, uh, along with what you were just talking about with that story, the more you read it, the more you see. So in other words, that becomes a uh, reading on more than one level. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, which is another way of thinking of critical reading, do you encourage your students to try to read on more than one level? Yeah, uh, I, I would say that I do. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I would say that uh, the way that I encourage that, so I, I can say uh, something that uh, uh, a student said about me one time, uh, I was uh, teaching a class where there were uh, films that I was showing in the class and one of the students uh, uh, who was having me for the first time asked if all of the movies in the class were going to be weird. And before I could respond, another student who had had me in a previous semester said, probably everything you read and watch in one of Andy's classes is gonna be weird, but then you'll talk about it and it won't seem so weird after <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> so, so I, 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 that's the way that I encourage uh, students to think about the, uh, those okay. things. Okay, Dwayne, I think Dwayne had his hand up. Yep. Where did he go? Yep. He's um, right. He's there. Which, uh, uh, Dwayne number 1.2 or? <laughs> <laughs> Other Dwayne left. He had another meeting he had to go to. Um. Yeah, I, I want to go back to what you were saying about expository dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to repeat it because I think you were actually there when you said it. 
<laughs> well, but, but one thing I've noticed recently in um, some, some movies, um, and, and I'm actually thinking of The Chosen, uh, for, for example, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a, basically it's a series about Jesus and, and the disciples, which, uh, you know, uh, it's done by the son of um, uh, the, the guy who wrote the Left Behind series, which never particularly impressed me. Mm -hmm. But um, th th this does, in terms of writing, how it's put together. Uh, <clears throat> um, but but I, I've noticed in this and, and, and in other um, movies too, the expository dialogue doesn't begin at the beginning of the, the conversation. And it's, in fact, it's not complete, uh, but um, it's left to the reader or listener to fill in the missing pieces. And yet it's constructed in a way that you can do that. Uh, what, what, what comments would you, um, you know, make about that? Well, it, it kind of sounds like uh, that's less expository dialogue because of the fact that there are gaps to fill in, if I'm understanding you correctly. Uh, and like a scene begins, for example, the, the disciples are walking down the road and, um, and, and it, it may begin with, well, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's kind of like what, you know, Thomas said before about such and such, you know, um, and, um, and, and, and so you, you, you are, are able to, to, to piece together what they've been, you know, you, you, you're able to fill in the gaps. You're able to know what is unspoken. Uh, so it doesn't insult your in, intelligence, I, I guess. Yeah, so I, I mean, that, that sounds fine because that doesn't sound uh, uh, like, you know, the more over the top versions of expository dialogue where people just start explaining things that you assume the other characters know uh, or the other characters like understand, but the viewers don't. Uh, and so you feel like you have to get that out. And so, like I said, in screenplays and plays and television writing, sometimes that stuff can be kind of necessary because you have to get the information uh, to the viewer somehow. Uh, but in, in prose, you don't have to do that because your narrator can just do it for you. Andy, in prose nowadays, uh, do you see less uh, backstory being worked in through flashback? Um, uh, so the, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I would say that it's, it kind of seems like what kind of work we're talking about. Uh, and so I would say that there are times where there are uh, like flashbacks are used, but uh, when we're talking prose, just because you suddenly get something from the past doesn't mean it's a flashback because a flashback is a specific character remembering something from the past. But if the writer just decides to give you information from the past or even a scene from the past, that's not necessarily a flashback unless it's a character who's remembering it. Uh, and so I, I would say that maybe that's the difference is that uh, if you know, we are suddenly jumping into a character's head, then we might get a flashback. But otherwise, like uh, I would say that that's not a flashback. It's just information from the past, a scene from the past, something like that. Uh, and then I guess the other thing is, is that uh, sometimes, you know, people will say things like, you know, unless it's extremely important, don't put it in. Although I would say that that is going to come down to what kind of writing you're doing. Uh, so if you want to write a page turner, then you might not be using, you know, a lot of flashbacks or even, you know, backstory. Uh, but there are times where you want to focus on characters uh, instead of like foregrounding the plot. And so when you do that, you might need more information about them, so. Okay, that's helpful. Who else has questions? Anybody? How, how often do you write a week or a day and what is your writing process? Do you write longhand? Do you type on a computer, on a laptop, what, with a pen and pencil? 
Uh, so I mostly write at night because I'm a night person. Uh, I write by typing and by writing, uh, like, you know, with a pen. Uh, it just kind of depends what I feel like at the time. Uh, ultimately, I type uh, because I can type a whole lot faster than I can uh, write with a pen. Uh, uh, I have strangely slow handwriting, so, so there are times when I just get frustrated with that and start typing. Uh, the other thing I would say is, is it kind of depends where I am in the process of any particular project. Uh, because I am a person, so I feel like some people really, really like the early stages of writing and find the later stages of writing like difficult uh, or tedious or what have you. Uh, I am the opposite. The early stages of writing are extremely difficult for me. Uh, and so when I'm first starting something, so let's say a, a short story or an essay, when I'm first starting something, I might only like work 45 minutes in the first day on that thing. Uh, because it just makes me, you know, so uh, annoyed, angry, frustrated, whatever, uh, that it's not doing what I want it to do yet. Uh, but then as we continue, as I get closer to the later stages, uh, that's when it gets far more exciting to me and I can spend a whole lot more time on it. So I just recently finished writing a short story uh, and the last day, I don't know how many hours I was working on it and I don't care because I was very happy to be doing it. Uh, but I was happy to be doing it because it was near the end of the process. The beginning of the process, uh, a friend of mine uh, who is now entirely too busy for me to talk to about writing all the time. Uh, but when we were younger, I did. Uh, and he could tell you where I was in the process depending on like my phone calls. So if I called him up and I sounded angry and frustrated, he was like, oh, you just started this piece. huh?" <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so that's I. Uh, uh, that's what I do. Uh, I know people like to say things like, uh, "You have to write first thing in the morning." And if that was the case, I would have written nothing and published nothing, uh, because I am a night person. <laughs> Andy, do you use an outline? Yeah, so I I'll make outlines sometimes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> So that's part, I, I like, I use an outline, I research things, uh, although since in the end, you know, like I'm still doing creative writing, like I, my research involves finding enough information so I can use it. Uh, and so sometimes like friends of mine who are in a particular field that I happen to be researching, that, I mean, they'll point out that I'm not 100% right about something, but since I'm like doing creative writing, it's not like I'm writing a, you know, like dissertation on physics. So, uh, uh, so the fact that my uh, friend who's an engineer, his name is Jim, he will frequently say, well, this doesn't exactly work. And this just like engineers tell you everything is wrong, which is their job. So that's fine. Uh, but it's, it doesn't bother me that much because uh, I'm using it for a different purpose. Question, do you submit a lot of your shorter work to potential publishers like magazines and uh, quarterlies, journals, things like that? Do you submit a lot to try to get things published and what's your success ratio on that? Or do oh, well, I don't know what the percentage is. I've certainly been rejected far more than I've been accepted. Uh, but the, yeah, I, I, so back when you still had to do that via the snail mail instead of the, uh, online. Uh, so when I, I was doing this, let's say when I was going to the university of Alabama and one day I had this like stack of envelopes like this, this high. And one of my professors like was like, ended up standing behind me and he goes carpet bombing, huh? Uh, and yes. Yeah, so I, I send them out all over the place to get published. Okay. Carol? Uh, I'm curious if any of your students who take the class are indifferent or nervous when they start and you surprise them by giving them guidance that they get excited about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, the, so particularly in workshop, mm -hmm. uh, the the early like times of being in workshop can be very nerve-wracking for people because they think it's 
like terrifying to hear somebody say that something isn't working or something like that. Uh, but like, you know, and I felt that way too, but the more that you go to workshop, I, I don't know, like people like to say you like build up a skin for it or something like that. To be honest, I think after a while, you just start listening for people who are good at responding to your work. And the people who aren't very good at responding to your work, like mentally, you thank them for giving it a shot, but uh, uh, you, you know, you don't, you just don't listen to them as much and you don't worry if, uh, you know, they, they think that your piece isn't working very well. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that the people who can respond well to your work love it. They might think that something isn't going, you know, very well. Uh, however, you are, are willing to say, oh, this person understands what I'm doing. So the fact that they think that I need to rewrite this paragraph or something, uh, I should listen to them. Uh, and so I, I like that's, you know, the sort of thing that you build up uh, over, you know, time. Uh, so I have the people I know that I can send my work to and so, uh, they understand what I'm doing. And if it's not working very well, they'll give me comments on it. So. Okay, anyone else? Interesting that it gives you a perspective, though. That's the biggest thing I've got out of workshop is, is hearing what other people have to say about what I write and then going home and digesting it and thinking about it. And uh, even the people that don't like what you're writing, what I'm writing, or, or don't get it, you know, you, get, you learn to understand why they don't get it. Yeah. And that, you know... It makes you understand what you want to write and why. Yeah, absolutely. My question is on a lower level is how do you, do you have tricks or how do you bounce between projects? Uh, how do you know it's time to work on something else? Do you have, do you give yourself deadlines? Uh, you know, like today I'm going to get back into the novel that I'm writing that I haven't uh, done anything with for two weeks. Uh, so I don't, I don't really necessarily give myself deadlines. Uh, instead, what I would say is, is that uh, I just keep working on something. Uh, and I, I mean, I either stop when I think it's done, and then I need to set it aside so I can look at it later. Or when I just feel like I reach a point uh, where I don't exactly know what to do next. Uh, and so then I'll set it aside and start working on something else, uh, and then like come back to it later. Uh, so I, I honestly, I would say that my, most of my very first book of short stories is a bunch of short stories I wrote when I was originally, when I was very young, uh, and then came back to much later and rewrote all of them. Uh, and that hadn't been any sort of plan. That's just the way it happened. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, I would say that I'm more like that. So other people, like they have to set certain times, you know, when they're going to write, they have to set themselves deadlines. All of that is fine. That's, that's not necessarily the way that I operate. Uh, but uh, I know people who do and it works for them. So uh, in, in that case, you just have to decide what works best for you. So. Do you find that various projects um, <clears throat> kind of nurture or feed each other. I, I know that with my painting and with my writing, if I'm working on several at once, something will occur to me about one of the ones I'm not working out. And it was brought on by something I'm tackling with the current project. Uh, so I find that that's very fertile for me to have several projects going at once. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I definitely know people uh, who do that. Uh, I don't necessarily. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, I would say that when I was working on my novel, I wasn't working on anything else. Uh, and the only time that I will end up uh, uh, working on something that isn't a part of the current project is if somebody uh, happens to ask me to uh, and then, you know, like to do something, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and so then I have to write this different thing. Uh, 
Uh, but most of the time when it's just me deciding, uh, I will write, you know, whatever the current project is until I think it's done or until I think I can't do anything else with it. That, and, and again, that's just me. And the other thing is, is that I only have one medium and that's, that's writing. Uh, and so like, I have no visual art skill or anything like that. So I, I can't, you know, go to a painting or something like that, uh, because of the fact that I just can't do it. So. Anyone else? Uh, Andy, would you tell us again the names of those books that you talked about? I've, I've got The Art of Fiction by David L O G E S. Is that how do you? No, know? it's uh, L O D G E. Uh, the L O D G E. Okay. Uh, and the, the third slant was that? No, it's Tell It Slant. Tell It Slant. Yeah, like the uh, uh, Emily Dickinson poem. Uh, uh, and then uh, the other one that I said, yeah, there it is. Oh, there it is. Yep. <laughs> Andy or Roger has it on his uh, yep. on his desk. Tell it slant. Okay. Uh, well, and then uh, uh, the other one was the uh, the three. I think it's called the three a.m. Epiphany. Uh, it's in my office on campus, and I'm not there. Otherwise, I could just grab it and tell you. But uh, that's a that's a book of writing exercises that get you to think about. Uh, writing in different ways. And I use some of those exercises sometimes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So those are the three, those are the three books I was talking about. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This has been very helpful for me personally. I, I learned a lot. I'm sure the rest of us did too, except for Roger. He's already heard most oh, no. of it. <laughs> so. That's why I like listening to Andy. I learned something every time. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me uh, talk with you guys. It was great to meet you. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I hope that uh, the rest of your writers meeting goes wonderfully. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure you're going to see at least one of one of our faces in class one of these days. Right, Ruth? <laughs> hope so. Yeah. But before you go, Andy, um, I, I'm just saying this most of the pique your, your curiosity and I know you're busy, but you, you, you could uh, stick around if you want, but part of our agenda today is going to deal with something that will, uh, if it goes well, it, it may prompt one of us to get back in touch with you okay. ask for your input on, on something, so. Okay. Um, yeah, well, uh, again, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me. Uh, and uh, like I said, uh, ha have a have a good meeting, uh, and I hope to see all of you again soon. Okay, thank you. Did, did you Thanks email me your uh, snail snail mail address? I don't think I did, so I'll I'll have to. I'll need that. to get that so we can get you a check. So oh. okay, all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. you so much. Bye bye. Bye, bye Andy.